When you save on auto insurance for driving safe with USAA SafePilot, you'll feel like a big deal. Even in a traffic jam. Save up to 30% with USAA SafePilot. Restrictions apply. This is episode number 17, and today we are continuing our Hemi talk. We're also talking Project Car of the Week, high performance parts, and listener stories once again. If you are a Mopar enthusiast, then you are in the right place. Don't go anywhere. You're tuned into the best Mopar enthusiast driven podcast on planet Earth. And I'm your host, Chris Albrecht, better known as the Mopar Hunter. And this is Talking Mopars. You're listening to Talking Mopars with the Mopar Hunter, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Last week, we talked about the legendary 426 Hemi in what was part two of the three-part series on the history of the Hemi here on Talking Mopars. Well, this is it, folks, the final installment. Part three is here, and we are ending the series on the modern era of Hemi engines. But first, we're talking Project Car of the Week, high-performance parts, and listener stories. Before we jump into the show, I want to stray off Mopars for just a minute here to say thank you to everyone who voted for Talking Mopars in the podcast magazine Hot 50 list. For their second issue. The Hot 50 list is generated solely from listener votes for their favorite podcasts. So I am extremely proud and humbled to say that we made the list. In Podcast Magazine's second issue, Talking Mopars placed 16th in the Hot 50. The crazy thing is the podcast ranked among some of the most popular podcasts on the planet, even ranking three down from Joe Rogan's podcast, who made number one in the inaugural issue. Now, If you don't know who Joe Rogan is, let's just say he's an actor, comedian, UFC commentator, and world-renowned podcaster. His podcast is arguably the biggest podcast on planet Earth, so the fact that he made number one in the first issue and number 13 in the second and that we came in number 16th right below him is just insane. It's a huge accomplishment and a testament to the power and loyalty of the Mopar community. Another crazy thing is that Talking Mopars is the only automotive podcast to ever be ranked on the list. Now, I know we're only two issues into that magazine, but that's still, that's bragging rights, folks. No one can ever take that from Talking Mopars. So that is great. And I want to take this moment to thank all of you listening for your support and to everyone who voted. Thank you so much. To make this list is an honor. And now Talking Mopars is cemented in history as the first automotive and the only Mopar podcast to make that list. So with that said, remember to send me your stories, questions, comments, complaints, suggestions, and so on to me at chris at talkingmopars.com. Or you can leave me a voice message and I will share it on the podcast at my new number, which is 209-28-MOPAR. And since we're talking about it, no one has sent me a voice message yet to share on the show. Don't be scared, folks. Come on. Trust me. It'll be a good time and you could be one of the first people to ever have their voice heard on the best Mopar podcast in history. All right? So let's stop messing around and let's get this show on the road. This week's Project Car of the Week is something a little bit different that I see a ton of potential in. And to be honest, I really want to find one someday because I think they are awesome. And I'd love to build one into a street machine. So today, we have a sweet... 1966 Dodge A100 pickup that was posted on the Mopar Hunter Facebook page on Tuesday, February 25th at 9 a.m. Here is the ad. 1966 Dodge A100 pickup, $2,500, Riverside. 1966 A100 three-window pickup, builder, six-cylinder, auto, not running, missing windshield and tailgate, $2,500. If you email, include phone number, no number, no reply, call or text. This listing says that the title status is missing. Depending on your state, you should be able to get a title for it. You can file a missing title. You can get the paperwork for missing titles and whatnot. But as long as you can verify that the seller is the last registered owner, it should not be a problem to obtain a title, depending on what state you're in. In some states, I've heard that you don't even need a title for vehicles that are this old. So, you know, it varies state by state. So if you were to look at something with a missing title, be sure to do your research on missing titles in your particular state. 
So, moving on. This thing is cool. Like I said, I see tons of potential in this truck, so let's talk about first impressions. I don't know about you, but when I see any project car or truck that I'm interested in, I start thinking of all the possibilities with it. This A100 is no different. The rake alone on this thing is so exaggerated that, you know, it reminds me of an A100 that Ed Big Daddy Roth would have drawn. The only thing that's missing from this thing is a giant green monster protruding from the roof with its monstrous hand on a disproportionately sized shift knob with clouds of smoke engulfing the rear wheels. You know what I mean? This thing is cartoony and I'm into it. Let's talk price. For $2,500, I think this would make an awesome project. I think it would be really fun for somebody to get it um, as long as you got that title stuff taken care of. Now, let's say I got it and I got all the title stuff worked out and in it made sense for me to pick this truck up. So here's what I would do. First, I'd have to get everything in safe working order as I would with any project vehicle. The brakes got to work and the engine has to run. So once those issues are ironed out, I would probably make a phone call to my pals down in Oregon at Wildcat Auto Wrecking to find me some glass and a tailgate. You can find Wildcat at their website, which is wildcatmopars.com. They are a Mopar-specific salvage yard in Sandy, Oregon that has several hundred Mopars that they are parting out, and they have a number of project cars for sale, so be sure to check them out regardless if you are in the Pacific Northwest or not. Once I got the truck complete, you know, I got that missing tailgate, and I got all the window glass in, I'd probably try to do what I could to repair some of the rust, but I would buy this truck to build a ratty running and driving street machine and do the body work as I go. At least that's what I would intend to do. So that brings me to paint. I'd probably just rattle can it, to be honest. If I'm going to do metal work along the way, there's no sense in, you know, trying to paint it right away. And since the whole goal is to get it up and running as quick as possible, you know, it probably needs a lot of body work. So I'd imagine that the best, you know, plan of action would be, you know, just rattle can it or get some really cheap paint and spray it on with an HVLP. I'd probably go a flat black and then maybe I'd experiment with some pinstripe work or have someone come out and do something cool to it. Um, same with the interior. I'd shoot that all flat black as well and probably have the dash pinstripe too, maybe the door panels. Um, I would just want an easy and cheap way to get the truck covered in one color and, you know, uh, cheap and easy would be the best idea if I'm planning on doing any metal work along the way. And the pinstriping is just kind of, you know, to polish a turd a little bit, let's be honest. You know, if it's going to have crappy body work and stuff until I get it done, then you might as well, you know, throw some pizzazz at it. Why not? My intention isn't to have a show winner here yet, you know? It's just to get the truck on the road, and that's what I would do if it was mine. Next, I'd probably try to locate a set of low back bucket seats. I know there are companies out there that make these custom bucket seats, the low backs, to order. So you can pick colors, you know, stitching, inserts, that kind of stuff. So there are companies that can do that, and I think some clean buckets would really be nice to have on the inside. An alternative to the bucket seats would be some fabricated bomber seats. I've seen some really cool bomber seats that were custom made. They have the rivets in them and really nice bead rolled patterns. Those are cool. That would be fun too. Next, I definitely want to keep the exaggerated, you know, staggered look to the wheels and tires with that really aggressive rake, but I definitely upgrade to some slotted mags or some craggers, keeping the wheel and tire sizes widely disproportionate, you know, so the thing stays raked. And once this thing is operational, I'd enjoy it while I hunt down a new power plant because, let's face it, if you got something that looks that cool, the Slant 6 may not complete the job. So for this hypothetical project, I think I would do a third generation Hemi swap just to keep things interesting. Since we're talking hypothetically here, why not throw a supercharger on it too? So a supercharged modern Hemi would be really cool in this thing. It would definitely turn some heads. And of course, if I'm going modern Hemi, then my first call would be to Blake at DIYHemi.com for all my wiring needs for the modern Hemi. And not just for wiring either. Blake is an encyclopedia when it comes to these modern Hemi swaps. Blake is the man to get a hold of. Remember, DIYHemi.com. And of course, there's going to be tons of other little details that would undoubtedly go into this build. But that's just what I dreamt up in my head really quick when I saw it. So there you go. A Wild Street Machine A100. And here's where I ask the most important question of this segment. What would you do with it? That question is posted on my social media channels for Talking Mopars and the Mopar Hunter. So let me know on those threads. And that was Project Car of the Week.
This is High Performance Parts, the segment of the show where we take a couple minutes to highlight a Mopar from TV or movie history. This week's High Performance Part belongs to the 1967 Plymouth GTX convertible in the road comedy film Tommy Boy, starring Chris Farley and David Spade. It's about the slacker son of an auto parts company owner who tries to save the family business after his father passes away. And with the help of his father's snarky business accountant, the two embark on a hilarious business road trip in a 1967 Plymouth GTX that doesn't actually fare too well throughout the film. Thankfully, it appears as though the GTX used in the movie was actually a tribute car, but nonetheless, it's always tough watching a Mopar take a beating on the big screen. The car starts out as a beautiful light blue metallic convertible that has, you know, a slight rake to it with some craggers on it. It's a really clean looking car, and I think they chose well. Some subtle hints that can be seen throughout this movie indicate that this car was not an original GTX, but rather a tribute car, which makes it a little easier to watch the abuse the car takes throughout the movie. By the end of the movie, the convertible top and interior were completely destroyed due to an accident involving a presumably dead deer. I'll leave it at that so you can check out the movie and see for yourself how it all played out. But the car also loses the driver's side door and ends up having a replacement made up of cardboard and duct tape. And as far as the convertible top, at one point in the movie, a new top is actually crafted using an abundance of duct tape and a blue tarp, which is absolutely hilarious. The movie is great, and the car really does have a significant role in the film. It's pretty much throughout the whole thing. So, if you like silly road comedies, this one is bound to entertain you and make you laugh. If you watch the movie, you'll notice some of the mistakes made concerning the car, including a reference to the engine that is inaccurate, and some movie movie flub-ups that are kind of funny, like uh, the scene where the door, the driver's door, gets damaged at the gas station. If you watch really closely, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's pretty funny. And then the scene where the convertible top is destroyed the car at the very end of that scene may not actually be a GTX or even a Belvedere or satellite. So pay close attention to that. And good Mopar eyes will also notice the differences between an actual GTX and the clone used in the film. So pay attention to that. The star of this week's edition of High Performance Parts belongs to the 1967 Plymouth GTX tribute car featured in Tommy Boy. Rest in peace, Chris Farley. It's time once again for listener stories. This week's first story comes to us from Kelly Snap. Here is Kelly's story. Here's my 68 Coronet 440. I'm the third owner, second family. The lady I bought it from's grandmother bought it new. She supposedly stored it basically every winter. We live in Idaho, lots of snow and salt. And judging by its condition, I believe it. It has 51,000 original miles, original paint, vinyl top, and interior. The seats, especially the drivers, are showing their age with tears but nothing horrible. It's got a few little areas with some dents and dings, which I can proudly say none were from me, but no rust to be seen anywhere. I've had the carpet pulled clear back, and there is hardly a speck of surface rust anywhere in the floor. Same with the trunk pan. It was originally a 318 automatic column shifted car, nothing special, but last fall I finally completed swapping in a 2006 5.7 Hemi that I drove for a while with the 904 Trans, but just recently swapped in a Silver Sport A41. I know some would consider this a travesty, but I've been very careful to not do anything drastic that would be irreversible to get back to exactly stock. No major cutting, welding, etc. Plus, the way I figure driving it this way is keeping miles off of the original 318 and 904, which of course I mothballed and kept. It had an open 276 rear end, but quite a while ago I swapped it for a 391 limited slip. My mom bought it for me when I was 17, which was about 1999. Early on in my teenage years, I developed an interest in cars and anything automotive or mechanical so she always did whatever she could to help and support me, which I'm sure as a mom wasn't easy since my dad had already passed away in 1997 before I was even 14. She also recently passed away suddenly in 2015, so obviously this really has some sentimental value. With marriage and everything else that happens in life, this car had been through a streak of many years without ever being driven or even running, but my wonderful wife Alexis has been very supportive even in the middle of having a baby last April 2019, and we've gotten it on the road again and are definitely enjoying it. I enjoy your podcast. Keep it up. I will try and get some more pictures. Let me know if you have any other questions. Thank you for your story, Kelly. I'm sorry to hear about the loss of your father, but it's good to know that your mom was very supportive in his absence. And having that car is a great symbol of that trying time that your family went through and a symbol of your mom's role in supporting your love of cars at a young age. I'm really sorry to hear about her passing, but I'm sure that makes your coronet that much more special to you. 
It's great that your wife supports your project, even while being a mom. Great job, Alexis. The world of Mopar would be a better place with more supporting spouses like you in it. Kelly, I know you mentioned the A41 transmission being considered a travesty to some Mopar enthusiasts, but I say it's yours. Build it how you want, buddy. <laughs> it's better than rotting into the ground somewhere. So I will say that I like that you built it, leaving the possibility of returning it back to factory. If you ever decide to do so, that's always a good idea. And I also love the modern Hemi swap that you did. I'm always an advocate for modern Hemi swaps because one, the swaps are easier now than ever. Two, as the engines age, they will start to show up more often in wrecking yards, making it easier to find parts. And generally, if they're showing up a lot more, that means there's going to be an abundance, which makes them a little cheaper. And three, they are extremely tunable and respond very well to modifications when they're built right. So sounds like you have a really clean Coronet, buddy, and it looks great. Thanks for sharing the pictures, and I really hope this car turns out to be the new family heirloom starting with you. Thanks for listening to the show, Kelly, and for sending in your story. Our second story for this week is from John Bernatis. Here is John's story. Howdy. I've got a story on my first Mopar slash car, and I'm a younger feller, which will probably be a nice change of pace for your show. I'm from Colorado, at least until a few months ago. A couple years back, I got a summer job bucking hay for some family friends who were Mopar people. I worked six days a week, sometimes high on 10 hours a day. In the dry heat of eastern Colorado, often in large, uninsulated metal buildings, so the heat was unbearable. But I remember so vividly waiting for my dad to pick me up from work one day in July and sitting out on the porch in front of said family friend's house looking for cars on Craigslist when I see this ugly brown four-door sedan from Plymouth I've never heard of. So naturally, I click on the ad. I look at the listing and I remember thinking this would be a nice beater until I can afford that 70 Challenger TA, which at the time was my dream car. Later that night, I'm talking with my dad about this weird car and he texts his friend, whose dad was a big Mopar tuner way back when, and somehow the Polysphere V8 came up. And this friend's dad calls mine and he's yelling at him about that motor being special for some odd reason and offering to buy a motor in a car we didn't even have. So clearly something was up. We had to go look at this thing. A couple weeks passed and some friends had taken me to look at some other cars. They didn't want more than I had and would have been much more practical, but much more boring. These friends are also Mopar people, having a Ram Charger and at the time a Jeep XJ. I had a short day at work because the family friends knew I was giddy about going to see this car. I could hardly focus on actually working. My dad picks me up and we drive clear to the other side of Denver to look at this thing. We drive by. The hood's open. I'm told that's not a good sign. We go around the corner and get dinner. We come back around and pull into a sketchy yard with a few old Dodge pickups and an old Challenger Derby car. My dad talks with the guy for a bit while I drool over everything this guy has. He calls me over so we can go for a test drive. Seems pretty basic. He drives us around the corner and flips around to head back. On our way back to this place, my dad floors it. The back end kicks out, tire smoke comes pouring in from the back seat, and the speedo is showing triple digits. He goes to slow down before the light and the car bucks to the right. Brakes were bad. We pull back into this guy's house. My heart's still beating like racehorses. I remember quite vividly my dad saying, well, what do you think? And I just said, when can we come and get it? About a week later, we came back with a borrowed trailer and got the car, and she's been with me ever since, for almost seven years. Note, I didn't add ages, names, or generally more detail for the privacy of every other party involved. I'm sure you can understand. Hey, John, thanks for your story. You didn't actually mention what Plymouth it was that you ended up buying, but I can actually make an educated guess since you mentioned the poly-headed small block, likely a 318 and probably inside a mid-60s Belvedere or something like that. I could be wrong, but you'll have to correct me if I am. The polyspherical V8s were interesting, and while no Hemi, they did have some cool aspects to them, and we're going to have to discuss them on a future episode, because I think we could highlight the poly V8s and talk quite a bit about them, so look forward to that on another episode. I like that your dad let that old Plymouth eat a little while it was out on a test drive. I am a big proponent of really putting a car through the paces on test drives. I mean... You need to know what you're getting yourself into, right? You need to know what that car can do. So what better way than getting that rear end to come loose and burning a little rubber? There is no better way. Your dad clearly knows how to test drive cars properly. Very cool. It sounds like you have yourself a fun toy, John. I'm curious to see if you just drive it for transportation purposes or if you plan on doing a little hot rodding with it. Keep me posted, man. And thanks for sending in your story. Those are the listener stories for this week. If you want to hear yours on this show, email me your story at chris at talkingmopars.com or call and leave me a message that I can share on the podcast by dialing my new number, which is 209-28-MOPAR. Once again, 209-28-MOPAR. Also, before I forget, 
To those of you who have sent in pictures to go along with your stories, I will be sharing those on social media unless you ask me specifically not to, then I will respect those wishes. But I've had some people ask me to see the pictures of not only the Project Car of the Week, but also of the listener story Mopars. So if anybody has sent me those pictures, I will be sharing them soon. So keep an eye out on my social media because your car will be featured at some point for the Mopar world to see. Nineteen seventy one marked the end of the elephant era. It would be thirty two years before we would see the Hemi make its triumphant return, but it didn't actually do it in a performance car. Instead, the new five point seven liter Hemi, which was three hundred and forty five cubic inches and three hundred and forty five horsepower, that's one horsepower per cubic inch, would be found in Dodge Rams alongside the tried and true five point nine Magnum V eight. By two thousand and four, if you wanted a V eight in your heavy duty Ram, you could actually only get the Hemi. Also available in 2004 was the first Durango with a Hemi. And the new Hemis, while inspired by the Hemis of the past, don't have quite the same hemispherical combustion chambers as the originals. But don't shoot the messenger, folks. I'm just telling you the truth. The modern Hemis still have their opposing valves and spark plugs right smack in the middle. So when I say plugs, I'm also not just referring to eight plugs. No, no, no. The new Hemi has 16 plugs, that's right, in case you didn't know, the modern Hemis have two spark plugs per cylinder. And before we dive into each of the modern street Hemis, it's important to say that there were thousands of 426 Hemis produced. The exact number varies depending on your source, but let's say loosely around 10,000 street Hemis were produced between 1965 and 1971. Compare that to the millions of modern Hemis that will someday be available as dropouts and rebuildable cores. I think the modern Hemis have a bright future, finding their way under the hoods of race cars and classic Mopars as well. In fact, they already are. The modern Hemi swap movement within the Mopar community is growing, and with guys like my friend Blake from DIY Hemi on a mission to Hemi swap the world, it's safe to say that there will not only be zero shortage of third generation Hemis to play with due to high volume production, but also zero shortage of modern Hemi swap vehicles on the road and on the track. So let's talk about the engine that marked the long-awaited return of the Hemi. The first go at modern Hemi engines for the 2003 model year introduced us to the 5.7 liter Hemi. This engine changed the game for modern Mopars as we know them today. By 2005, the new Hemi could be found under the hoods of not only the trucks and SUVs, but the cars as well. If I can say just one thing here, and I may get roasted for this, but I'm willing to take that risk. In the front-wheel drive turbo Mopar era, Chrysler put a turbocharged four-cylinder in some of their minivans. Some of them even had five-speed transmissions. Now, while a rarity today, they are pretty cool and some are very quick. Don't believe me? Look it up. You can see on YouTube that there are some really fast turbo caravans and Plymouth Voyagers out there. So, you know, take what I'm saying and believe it. This is not fake news, okay? There are fast minivans out there. All right, folks? Now, here's where I may get roasted. Why hasn't a Hemi found its way into the modern minivans? You know? History should repeat itself and there should be a Hemi-powered Mopar minivan. There. I said it. Those words have never been spoken before on a podcast. Hemi-powered Mopar minivan. Hey FCA, you're welcome. You can go ahead and make that check out to the best Mopar podcast ever. Okay? <laughs> All jokes aside, I think the juice would actually be worth the squeeze on an SRT Grand Caravan. You know, am I saying that because I have an eight-month-old daughter and I plan to have more kids? Maybe. But also because I'm a weirdo and I grew up around vans, so a trick van with a Hemi is right up my alley. And even if, even if my wife despises vans. <laughs> All right? So back to the topic. You know, it's been a while since I went off the rails, so forgive me. By the time 2005 came along, you could actually find a Hemi in Jeep Grand Cherokees, Dodge Chargers, Dodge Magnums, and the Chrysler 300C in addition to the Rams and Durangos that were already available with them. And 2006 introduced the Hemi-powered Jeep Commander. 2007 saw the Chrysler Aspen sporting the Hemi. And then finally, when the new Challenger was released, you absolutely could find a Hemi in one of those. Power ratings for the first of the 5.7 Hemis ranged from 340 horsepower at 5,000 RPM to 345 horsepower at 5,600 RPM, with torque ranging from 375 pound-feet of torque at 4,400 RPM to 390 pound-feet of torque at 4,000 RPM. In 2005, 
cylinder deactivation was also introduced. Known as MDS or multi-displacement system, this system cuts off fuel entirely for four of the eight cylinders when you don't need the power from them. So the system was used in cars at first and then actually ended up being used in the trucks later down the line. In 2003, the Hemi would be revised. So these new modifications to the engine would result in better fuel economy and more power. What does that mean? The best of both worlds. So where the old carbureted monsters would guzzle fuel with reckless abandon at the mere touch of the go pedal, the new Hemis were far less fuel hungry. With better flow overall, a higher compression ratio, and an active intake enabling intake runner length to vary through the engine's RPM range, this engine was vastly superior. With the addition of variable valve timing and a host of other changes, the 5.7 Eagle Hemi, as it has been nicknamed, not only had more power across the board, but delivered better fuel mileage and reliability. So, the power was drastically increased to around 390 horsepower with all of these modifications. And... More horsepower is never a bad thing. So, for the sake of time, I actually won't be getting into too much of the technical details about these modern Hemi engines, but at the end of the show, and that's only so that you don't fall asleep on me, okay? <laughs> but at the end of the show, I'm going to provide you with a few resources for you to learn more if you choose to do so. So, moving on from the 5.7 brings us to the first Hemi-powered vehicle wearing an SRT badge. SRT, if you didn't know, stands for Street and Racing Technology and is the high-performance division within FCA. The first Hemi offered in SRT vehicles was the 6.1-liter Hemi found in the 2005-2010 Chrysler 300s, the 2005-2008 Dodge Magnums, 2006-2010 Dodge Chargers, 2006-2010 Jeep Grand Cherokees, and 2008-2010 Challengers. So if you saw any of the vehicles mentioned with an SRT badge, unless it's somebody being a poser, you had a 425 horsepower, 6.1 liter, 372 cubic inch Hemi lurking beneath the hood. 2011 would mark the end of the 6.1 and would introduce us to the 6.4 392 Hemi known as the Apache. The 392s started off with a respectable 470 horsepower upon their initial release, but by today in 2020, they are knocking on the door of 500 with 485 horsepower. One thing about these modern Hemis is that their cylinder heads flow amazing. If you look at all the numbers, you'll be impressed, I assure you. Just when you thought things couldn't get any better. Chrysler said, hey, hold my beer, and introduced their first supercharged production Hemi. At 6.2 liters and 378 cubic inches, this boosted beast produced a fire-breathing 707 horsepower and 650 pound-feet of torque and it only took the twin-screw supercharger 11.6 PSI to propel the Hemi into the pole position for bragging rights of the most powerful V8 and the most powerful muscle car of all time. Consequently, at full throttle, the Hellcat guzzles 1.5 gallons per minute. So basically, the thing growls with thirst whenever it so much as smells a gas station and burps after every fill-up. But if you're looking for decent fuel mileage, don't avoid a Hellcat. If you keep your foot out of it, you'll see an EPA estimated 13 miles per gallon city and 22 miles per gallon on the highway. Good luck with all of that. Here's the crazy thing. The Hellcat was introduced in 2015. This show was released in March of 2020. Since 2015, Dodge and SRT have been very busy. Busy doing what, you ask? Busy making even more power. Everything changed in 2017 when Dodge brought back a familiar name with hell-raising intentions for 2018. The Challenger SRT Demon packed a larger 2.9 liter supercharger pushing 14 PSI of boost, making the Hellcat's 2.4 liter supercharger pushing 11.6 PSI tame in comparison. Producing 840 horsepower in full race trim, the Demon can light up the quarter mile in 9.65 seconds at 140 miles an hour, officially making it the fastest quarter mile production car in the world. Sorry, Hellcat. You've been dethroned. Just when you thought there was nothing left in the performance tank from Dodge, in 2019, they threw another iron in the fire. This time, the cat was sporting red eyes. Enter the Hellcat Red Eye. To keep things simple here as we bring this modern Hemi talk to a close, the Hellcat Red Eye proudly pushes 797 horsepower. Of course, even the standard Hellcat saw a bump in power from 707 horsepower to 717. Does it ever end? As a Mopar enthusiast, I sure hope not. There's no telling what Ma Mopar is cooking up in the Hemi kitchen, 
but I think I speak for all Mopar enthusiasts around the world when I say that I am anxiously looking forward to whatever they come up with next. Mopar or no car. That concludes our three-part series on the history of the Hemi. Thanks for joining me. If you are interested in learning more about the modern Hemi, I highly suggest a book from my friends over at CarTech Books called New Hemi Engines 2003 to Present by Larry Shepard. I've learned a ton of information while reading it to prepare myself for the build of my $100 Hemi that I spoke about on episode number 13. Also, for all of your modern Hemi swap questions, especially on wiring, get a hold of my friend Blake from DIYHemi.com. He's a genius. And of course, there's always Google too, but we all know how much people love to use the search function. (laughs) That's it, my friends. For more information about this podcast or to listen and subscribe to the show, please visit TalkingMopars.com. Remember, any outside references to people or resources that I mention on this show, I try to list in the show description or show notes. So be sure to check those out. And if I'm ever missing anything, feel free to let me know via my email. Also, don't forget that you can send me your stories, questions, comments, complaints, suggestions, and everything else you can think of to chris at TalkingMopars.com. Sharing the website, TalkingMopars.com, with all of your Mopar-addicted friends is the single best way to help me spread the word about this podcast. So please, help our brother out. Also, you can leave me a voice message that I will share on the podcast at my voicemail box, and the number is 209-28-MOPAR. And one more thing before I leave. I know I talked about earlier that we placed 16th on the Hot 50 list for Podcast Magazine. Well, Those votes take place every month, and I would absolutely love to see this podcast rank even higher than number 16. So if you're listening to this show right now, if you could do me a favor and go to podcastmagazine.com and vote for Talking Mopars, I would greatly appreciate it. Trust me, if this show blows up, you're all coming with me. We're all going to have a blast on this podcast, and I promise that we're off to a good start. My goal is to make this the best Mopar podcast in history. And we're just getting started, folks. And I'm glad you're here to join me. Until we talk again, I am your host, Chris Albrecht, and that was Talking Mopars. Thank you for listening to Talking Mopars, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Until next time, remember, no Mopar left behind. Say, my name is Mopar Sage, and that was Talking Mopars. (laughs) Try again, sweetie. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, All right, we tried. (laughs) Jake Knapp is the inventor of the design sprint and the New York Times bestselling author of the book Sprint. He's also the co-founder of Character, a venture fund for early stage startups. How and why did you start using Miro? I came from this position of thinking, I don't want to be doing stuff online to thinking now when I do a sprint in person with a company, it's like, we're going to use Miro, even though we're all in the same room, because that's a better way for us to get this work done. As an investor, we're basically investing in their ability to solve problems. We're saying, we think this group of people is going to be able to solve a problem in a really great way and create value by doing it. And actually, you need to give people the tools that can help them make decisions, help them collaborate, help them visualize and see things in a different way. And Miro does all those things. So to me, at least as an investor, I'm thinking, give the team the tools that are going to help them think, that are going to make the most, brighten their their skills as smart folks. And Miro is at the top of that list for me.